Yeah, I'm pretty excited today because this part of the course, we're talking about intermolecular attractions, and this is my area of research. So I do industrial cleaning research, and you might imagine uh, that if you look around the room, everything that was painted or coated or even the, the metal surfaces at the end of that manufacturing process, they have to be cleaned. They have to be cleaned before they're painted. After they're painted, how do you clean the paint? clean the dirt off the paint without taking the paint off the metal. Um, and all of that is based upon intermolecular forces. And so what seems like it might be just a little side trip into um, the properties of molecules, this is really an area of chemistry that governs everything that we do, everything that we clean, um, how we choose to clean things and so on. So one of the biggest principles that we'll learn today is like dissolves like. And so that phrase, you definitely want to commit to memory because that's how we decide what's going to interact with what. And we'll understand what like means here in a second. And then I always like to try to make it practical. And so this also will govern how our shampoo works. <laughs> okay, yes. So, don't have a lot of hair, but I still use shampoo, maybe that much. <laughs> and so we'll learn about that today. This is uh, in, in concert with other physical properties of liquids. In the text, they have you know paragraphs and figures about viscosity and surface tension and density. I just have one slide on it. Just wanna talk about those vocabulary words real quick though. Viscosity is a, is a liquid's resistance to flow. And so you've seen this um, in, in a good salad dressing, one that you buy, you know, brand name, you put the salad dressing on top of your salad and it stays on top of the leaves. Have you noticed that? Um, that's viscosity. It doesn't want to flow down. And the additive that they add for that is called xanthan gum. It's a flavorless compound. It's not uh, toxic or anything, but it's very viscous. And so they add in that xanthan gum to make it more viscous. So that when you put the dressing on top of your salad, it doesn't just run to the bottom. If you're ever in a, in a cheap restaurant and uh, or you buy really, really cheap off-brand, uh, say ranch dressing, you put it on a salad, it runs to the bottom of the bowl. You may have seen that. Or sometimes if they're trying to stretch their ranch at a restaurant, they'll water it down and they'll dilute that xanthan gum and their salad flows down. And so you notice these physical properties, even though you really don't know about them maybe, but you know that a lot of times they're, they're aesthetic reasons for having viscosity. In cleaning, if we want to clean dirt out of small holes, threads on screws, um, small tight places underneath circuit board uh, components, we need a low viscosity so that fluid will flow into those tight spaces. For our automobiles, for oil, lubricating the pistons in our combustion engines, we want a high viscosity. We don't want the oil to flow out of that small space. We want it to stay in that small space and provide lubrication. So for lubrication applications, greases and oils, you want a high viscosity. Um, for our salad dressing, we want a high viscosity. Uh, but for um, cleaning and rinsing, we want a low viscosity. Let's talk about surface tension. Surface tension, the idea of tension is think of a wire and and that's uh, it's it's given in terms of like millinewtons of force per meter. So it's it's a it's a tension term. But if you take that that uh, newton per meter and you multiply that by a meter on top and a meter on bottom, so I'm just multiplying by one. This top piece is a Newton times a meter, which is equal to a joule. And this bottom piece is a, is a meter square. So I think it is much more useful to think of surface tension as surface energy. It's the energy it takes to create surface. So if I'm gonna create another square meter of surface, how many joules does that take? Well, what, where does the joules come from? Well, think about this. If I wanna make this the surface layer, then I've got to break these two bonds or these two attractions. So it's going to cost me energy to make more surface. Does that make sense? I've got to move those atoms out of the way and spread them out. So I've got to break some of these intermolecular attractions to make more surface. And that's water has such a high surface tension that it can actually suspend things on top, like these little water spiders and water skippers. So that little, little insect's leg his little foot is touching the surface of the water and pushing down on those water molecules. 
if it were able to push that water molecule down and create surface, it would take energy to do that. Okay. And the what is the energy pulling this down? It's the mass of that bug times gravity. Okay, so gravity's pulling down on that bug, and that's a certain amount of energy, potential energy, and that energy is less than the surface energy of water. So it can walk on top of water because it doesn't weigh very much. Now I I thought, what if you were to lower the surface tension of water by putting a drop of soap on the water? And so I was at a at a you know a creek or pond where there was a bunch of little water spiders, and I put one little drop of soap in there. Well, they know how to survive, right? <laughs> as soon as that soap started running towards them, they took off. So they knew what was about to happen. If that water, if that surface tension dropped, they would sink and then be fish food. And so they got out of town and ran. And I thought it was pretty interesting that they knew how to test the surface tension of water and they, they ran away from that effect. So I thought that was pretty cool. So, um, and then density. Uh, density is the mass of uh, the substance per volume. And so we've already talked about this. Liquids have high densities, about a thousand times more dense than gases. And so in terms of our cleaning research, if we're using spray, we're spraying a liquid at a surface, the density matters because that's the, that's the momentum that those uh, molecules have at knocking off dirt and soil. When I talk about soil, soil is just matter out of place. It's, uh... And so it depends upon the context. When you're, when you're eating your food, you have food on your fork, that's not soil yet because you're still eating and you're eating and that's fine. But then after you're done eating, now all of a sudden that's soil. It needs to be cleaned off. It's not in the right place. Okay. So um, if we're spraying that, uh, a higher density fluid will, will have more impact and will we'll spray better and will clean better. Most of the time we, we use, use water anyway, but if you're dealing with solvents, then you would go for a higher density. So here are some of the physical properties of various liquids. Here's pure water, which has a density of one gram per cubic centimeter, same as one gram per milliliter. Look how high the surface tension of water is for, uh, compared to all these other solvents. So water is amazing. It has a very high surface energy or surface tension. And it's got uh, sort of a reasonable viscosity. Uh, some of these other solvents, you might have, you've got rubbing alcohol, okay, it's less dense than water. Um, it's got a very low surface tension, but a pretty high viscosity, which is surprising. It's more viscous than water. Acetone, about the same density, about the same surface tension, but a much lower viscosity. In fact, in the lab, when you, when you um, get into organic lab and you're using pipettes, you'll be probably familiar with aqueous solutions and you pull up uh, water in a little like a medicine dropper, and you can deliver that to your flask. If you try to do that with acetone, it flows right out the end. It's not very viscous at all. It's hard to use a water dropper or a, you know, like a medicine dropper or a pipette with acetone because of this very low viscosity. It flows really well. Uh, this is one of the more modern solvents that we're using to clean things with. It's trans 1,2-dichloroethylene. You will learn what that means in organic, but uh, it's a the ethylene part is a carbon-carbon double bond. You have a hydrogen here, a chlorine there, and the trans part just means it's on the opposite side of that double bond. The 1-2 means it's carbon-1 and carbon-2. So it's the trans-dichloro part on 1-2 ethylene. So trans-1-2-dichloroethylene. So that's a little bit of organic nomenclature. So this molecule is a very popular one in cleaning. It's got a high density, higher than water. It's got a low surface tension, so that means it flows well into small spaces and it flows quickly. It's a very low viscosity, so it's a great solvent. Okay. Now, what about soap? So down here we have water, and if you add just a little bit of a, a surfactant, a ethanol, I mean, to water, it doesn't change the density much, but look what happens to the surface tension. It drops a lot, and so that's what soap is doing. It's, it's creating... Uh, it's lowering the barrier to creating more surface that allows water to wet the surface um, when you add soap. And it doesn't change the viscosity very much either. 
So this is the main point here for today. Like dissolves like. And so we're going to discuss what that means right now. And then some say, some people say like interacts with like because not everything dissolves. So you can think of polymers or plastics or, or maybe even starches um, or carbohydrates. You know, water will wet the starch or carbohydrate, but it, it may not dissolve it. If it's a sugar, a smaller sugar, it will dissolve it. In fact, water can hold more than its own weight in sugar. So you can make more than a 50% composition solution of sugar water. So you can take 10 grams of water and put like 12 grams of sugar in it. <laughs> so which is the solvent, which is the solute there, right? You've got more sugar than water. That's like uh, some people, the way they like their sweet tea. It's like more sugar than, than water. So what do we mean by like? Well, like means that the solvent and the soil or whatever you're interacting with have similar intermolecular forces. So this is today's lecture on the topic of intermolecular forces. There's really three types. You could probably give, you know, probably come up with other types of attractions, but these are the three main types. So the dispersion attraction is related to the flexibility of the electron cloud. And so I've got a meth methanol molecule there and I'm kind of showing the electron cloud oscillating. The more flexible that cloud, uh, the, the more dispersion forces it has. And then we have polar attractions. So positive and negative portions of the whole molecule. So in this particular molecule, this is dichloromethane. It's got a, a positive end. That's what the blue indicates. So that's partially positive. And then this end, are, these are chlorines. They're neutral, really. They're not quite negative. But you could say that this is a negative or partially negative portion of that molecule. And so there's, there's two poles to the molecule, a positive and a negative pole. And so that's called a dipole because uh, there's two, a dipole, a positive and negative end. And so that's why that's called polarity. And that's for the whole molecule. And then hydrogen bonding are those NH and OH parts of the molecule. So this is methanol and it has an OH group. So just that group on the molecule has a pretty strong dipole and it can create really strong associations called hydrogen bonds. And we'll see some of those in a second. So there's these three types of forces, dispersion, polarity, and hydrogen bonding. Let's look at the evidence for these, okay? And the evidence that, that they exist in nature. Let's, let's plot the boiling point of different substances based on their molar masses. And so think about what's happening in boiling. We're taking a liquid, we're adding heat, generating kinetic energy, so the velocities of those molecules are going up. And eventually it reaches the point where they can all escape and turn to a vapor. So when we boil a substance, we're breaking all of the intermolecular attractions. So a boiling point is kind of a measure of all of the intermolecular attractions. If we can boil it, we can break all of them. And so boiling methane, you know, this is in degree C, so it's, it's under 150, you know, below zero. Okay, so maybe 160 below zero. That's the boiling point of methane. If we go up to the next one, like silicon, germanium, and tin, so if we just put hydrogens on there, these are little spherical molecules of an atom surrounded by four hydrogens. And notice that as we go up in molar mass, the boiling point's going up. Now don't get confused, this isn't a gravity thing. So it's not because the molecule's heavier. If we go up the periodic table and look at those masses, we see we also get a lot of electrons. And so this is really a growth of the electron cloud. So as these molecules get bigger, so do their electron clouds. And it's the electron cloud piece that's holding these together and creating a higher, higher boiling point. So these are the increase with the electron cloud is the dispersion uh, attractions. And every molecule has dispersion attractions. So you can write that down too, because that's always a quiz question or a test question. Which of these particular forces does every molecule have? That's how the question would be phrased. And it's either hydrogen bonding, polarity, or dispersion. And it's dispersion. Every molecule has dispersion forces. And dispersion forces go up with the size of the molecule. 
Let's jump past nitrogen, go over to the oxygen group, and let's come back from the bottom. So go to lyrium, selenium, and sulfur. So we'll put hydrogens on those. And the way that the valence electrons work out and so on, these molecules are bent. So they're not symmetric molecules. And we see that even though they haven't changed mass very much, we just went from germanium to selenium, notice that the boiling point went up a substantial amount. And so this is the dispersion plus the polar attractions. So the black line is, is a measure of their dispersion attractions. And then that little extra bit that's red is the polar piece because these molecules are bent. They have a positive area and a negative area so they can line up and create more of an attraction where the positives and the negatives can get close to each other. Now let's look at oxygen, OH2. It would look how this trend is. They're all about, you know, would you say 20 degrees higher than their uh, symmetric counterpart. And so we would expect water to be right here, but water's not right there. Water's way up there. So that's a huge deviation from the trend. And that's because water has all three types of intermolecular attractions. It has dispersion, it has polarity because it's asymmetric, it's bent, but it also has this hydrogen bonding piece where the OH can line up with another O. And so you can see that water, anything with OHs and NHs will be able to hydrogen bond. And then there's a special case of, of HF, so hydrogen fluoride by itself will hydrogen bond to other hydrogen fluorides. But that's pretty rare, and I don't want you to have in your mind that fluorines will hydrogen bond, because when you make fluorine molecules with organic compounds, they don't hydrogen bond, but HF will hydrogen bond. So let's just restrict hydrogen bonding to OHs and NHs. So any kind of NH group or OH group, uh, those lone pairs on the oxygen or lone pairs on the nitrogens will create a hydrogen bonding situation. So this is from the text. Well, let's talk about this idea that it's intermolecular forces. So this ER is important. You can have intramolecular forces, but those are inside the molecule. Intra means inside and inter means between. So inside the molecule, you have intramolecular forces. That would be like a covalent bond. It would be super strong. These intermolecular forces are between molecules, and they're much weaker, maybe a one-hundredth of the strength. Okay. And so what I'm showing here is the polarity. This is important to show that polarity is related to permanent dipoles. So this is in the structure of the molecule. And you can compare that to dispersion, which is temporary dipoles. So dispersion involves temporary dipoles. That's the flexibility of the electron cloud. If I have, uh, let's just say that uh, my head is the nucleus and these are two electrons moving around the nucleus. If they end up on one side of the nucleus, then I have a positive end and a negative end. But if they end up over here, then it's switched places. Now I have a negative end and a positive end. So this can happen in a neutral molecule. It can happen in a neutral atom as that electron cloud is flexible. If the electrons all kind of swish or flow to one side of the molecule, even a little bit, we have a temporary dipole moment. And that can cause things to be attracted to each other and can cause liquids to form and solids to form. And so this whole intermolecular forces is how we get liquids and how we get solids. If there were no intermolecular forces, everything would be a gas because there'd be nothing to cause a liquid state or a solid state. And then the hydrogen bonding is water molecules, OH, NH molecules, and so on. Uh, it's the OH interactions. And so you see this, this OH interacting with this oxygen. This isn't really drawn to scale. That would be much closer than that. You could also have an NH up here. So if we have it a nitrogen with a lone pair and a hydrogen here, and maybe a you know, another organic chain or something going off.
So this this lone pair can interact with that hydrogen, and so you can get a, a hydrogen bond with a nitrogen lone pair. So NHs and OHs will form hydrogen bonds. So how do we get things like oil and water to mix when they hate each other? There's Oil has only dispersion forces and water has dispersion, polarity, and hydrogen bonding. So how do we bridge that difference? Well, that's where surfactants come in. And if you look on the back of your soap bottle, I just grabbed a, a common soap uh, image off the internet. You see on here, sodium lauryl sulfate. It's almost always, you know, they list the ingredients from most abundant to least abundant. So the most abundant is water. And the very next component is sodium lauryl sulfate. And that's what this molecule is here, sodium lauryl sulfate. And it acts like a bridge. So water, you can have a part of that molecule that's water loving or hydrophilic. So hydro is the water part, philic means it. So philos is love, so, so water loving. And it can be this charged piece, like this SO4, this uh, sulfate piece which actually has a negative charge on it. This area right here is actually negative. Um, but it could also be this piece, this oxygen in the middle. So it has a lone pair on that side, maybe a lone pair on this side. And so you can get hydrogen bonding to this area too. We can fine tune all of these surfactants and that's a whole huge area of science too. Like you might even go into chemistry and become a surfactant chemist where you change the number of ethylene glycol units. This piece right here is ethylene glycol. So the eth means two carbons. Two, two OHs on there is a glycol piece. You can polymerize that. You can have two, three, four, five, two hundred of these ethylene glycol units on there. Um, and then we have this oil loving piece. So this really this single molecule really does act like a bridge to the oil layer. And it can get an oily substance to dissolve in water. And if we have extra, you know, body oils and so on in our hair and our hair is greasy, we can wash it with sodium lauryl sulfate. The, these hydrophobic pieces will get into the oil. And when we add agitation, we create things like micelles and liposomes, okay? The agitation is what causes that oil to form these structures. And then these structures are all surrounded by these water loving pieces and that can carry it out of our hair down the drain. So is that what causes the bubbling? Yeah, the bubbling is a stable foam. It's there for visual effect many times because if you didn't have a foaming shampoo, you'd use way too much of it. That might be good for their profits, but you'd be, you wouldn't be satisfied because it wouldn't really um, look like soap. Yeah, they do make so surfactants that don't produce foams and that's what they want to use in your dishwashing machines because of the sprayers. So in your dishwashing, uh, in your dishwasher, they have spray nozzles in there. And if you have a, a, a surfactant that creates a stable foam, then it'll fill the whole thing up with foam. And that's why you don't want to take your dishwashing liquid that you want to see, you know, sudsy and foamy and put that in your dishwasher because it'll just fill the whole thing up with foam. Uh, you, you stop the, the rinse cycle where we look inside there and it'll just be a cube of foam. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it may even come out through the little vent port and go all over your floor. And so you don't want to do that. Same thing with your clothes washer. So there's, and that's what a surfactant chemist does. They can make surfactants that work with water and oil that don't create stable foams and some that do. Okay. They, this is a side topic. We've got time though. Uh, there was a researcher at Texas Tech that, that did a, um, educational project. He made a little wearable computer. He had a ball cap. He had a mirror in front of your eye and a camera that watched your eye. Okay. And it could track your pupil where you were looking at a screen and it was for training, right? You go in and you, you know, you're training people to, to do a certain task and you're talking to them and they say, uh, you know, turn the orange, uh, faucet knob, whatever. And you, the person looks at the blue one and they turn the blue one. And so they know they looked at the wrong one, they turned the wrong one, your, your instructions need to be changed, okay? And then they could measure the pupil size and that would tell whether the person was uh, like um, understanding or not. So when they understood something or they achieved a goal, their pupils would get big, okay? If they were confused or, or listening or trying to figure something out, the pupils were small. So this, and that's, that's involuntary, okay? 
And so they, he got a big grant from the uh, FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, to look at the exit cards in the seat back pockets in front of you. You pull that out, find the exit, and they timed people, said, okay, find the overwing exit. So they would pull these cards out, they could see where they were looking, and they could see when they found it, their pupil would get big, and they knew, okay, they've understood it. Okay, so it's a pretty cool project. Then uh, a soap manufacturer gave them a grant to look at commercials, and they would track people as they looked at commercials to see what they looked at in the commercial and whether they liked it or not. Okay, and and they tried this on men and women, and it was pretty interesting. They did it on, on the men, uh, of course, they would have uh, – Women in the shower, and of course, their pupils would get really big, but the women didn't like that. Their pupils would get small. And so they said, well, let's get away from that. Then they showed different shower scenes where there was lots of suds. And the men were indifferent to the suds, but the women, the pupils got really big when they saw the foamy suds. And so that was how they were using pupilometry to decide, okay, we want a foamy soap for shampoo. Because a, a non-foamy soap, soap would work just as well. It just wouldn't be as satisfying and it probably wouldn't sell as well. So that's a little bit of side trip on uh, why we like to see those suds. Okay. Now let's talk about the thermodynamics behind it. This is a lot of equations. We'll cover these equations in physical chemistry. So hopefully you're still with us in a couple more years and you take my class, thermodynamics, and we'll look at the thermodynamics. But let me show you, you did in chapter, mm, I think it was seven, uh, in Gen Chem 1, talk about enthalpy of reaction, in, and Gibbs energy of reaction and entropy of reaction, okay? And so you've seen delta G and delta H and delta S, and I just wanna show you one thing, that a negative free energy change of a reaction is spontaneous. So if we have some things that we wanna dissolve, we need a negative delta G. And if delta G can be negative, then this things will mix, and that's, 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 that's dissolving something, okay? And so how can we get a negative delta G? We could have an exothermic mixing, and that really works with the ionic substances. So if you have a salt and it's dissol soluble in water, a lot of times it's, ne it's also exothermic, and you can feel heat. Uh, when you mix a salt and water, you can touch, you can hold on to the little um, container and you can feel heat. Uh, Acid-based neutralization, so protons and hydroxides getting together to make water, very exothermic. In fact, it's so exothermic it can boil the water. Okay, so this is a little bit of a lab safety thing. Uh, if you're trying to dilute acid, there's two ways to do that, right? In, in theory, you could take acid and pour it into the water, but as that acid dilutes the water, um, it's, it's locally, it's going to um, create a, quite a bit of heat, but you've got a lot of water and it can sink that heat. If you were to take water and try to dilute the acid, there's a little bit of water and a lot of acid and the heat goes into the water and causes it to boil. And it splatters and you get splattered concentrated acid on you and your face and everything like that. So you never add water to acid. You always add acid to water because there's a lot of water, it can sink the heat. And, and so that's heat of mixing that we're talking about, delta H of mixing. And so I always try to make my best Boston accent for this so you can remember. Do as you oughta, add acid to water. Okay, so you can remember that one hopefully. Now, temperature effect for mixing. If you're not dealing with acid solutions or salts, if you're just trying to mix nonpolar type stuff or polar stuff, but non-ionic stuff, then temperature can have an effect. Notice this minus sign right there. So if we raise the temperature, we can, we can favor mixing because entropy of mixing is always positive. So down here, uh, you, again, we're not gonna go through these equations in detail, but the entropy of mixing is positive, and so the temperature effect always favors mixing. So that's why when you heat stuff up, it dissolves better. I do wanna show though that this, um, this delta H of mixing depends upon these things called the solubility parameters. So let's look at solubility parameters. Enthalpy can be a barrier to mixing if it's positive. And so there's different scientists that have worked on solubility of polymers and other kinds of substances. One of them was Hildebrand, and he came up with a solubility parameter that uh, was polymers dissolving with uh, just regular organic solvents like hexane and, and, and octane and so on. 
And then Hansen came along in the 60s, and he broke it into these three intermolecular attractions, dispersion, polarity, and hydrogen bonding. And the reason I'm putting this in here is just to show you a practical example of our three intermolecular forces. Okay. Now, this is not in your textbook at all because this was developed in industry. And, and we have a real problem in terms of our education system. A lot of innovation takes place in industry and it doesn't make it back into academia, okay? So industry does done a lot of great things. And one of them is these solubility parameters. And yet this hasn't made it back into the textbooks, okay? So these are the three, the three different uh, intermolecular forces that we've talked about. And there's a Hansen solubility parameter for each. And so I can take every substance and I can look up the Hansen solubility parameters for that substance, and I can plot them in this three-dimensional gra uh, graph or grid. So this is hexane, something very similar to gasoline down here. Notice it has a dispersion piece, but it's totally hydrocarbon. It's just hydrogen and carbon. There's no OHs. There's no um, nitrogens or anything. So it's not polar at all, and it doesn't hydrogen bond at all. So that's where it would be in this three-dimensional plot. It has a zero for the polar component and a zero for the hydrogen bonding component. Whereas way up here is methanol. So that's an alcohol. It has an OH on it. Um, it's a really small molecule. So it's very polar and has a lot of hydrogen bonding. Um, over here is like dichloromethane and so on. So, so whenever we're trying to dissolve something, we have a difference in the solubility parameters. So the thing we're trying to dissolve is in the center of this sphere. And then if you have uh, a solvent that's outside that sphere, it's a bad solvent, it won't dissolve it. If it's inside the sphere, it's a good solvent and will dissolve it. So this is how we come up with the recipes on the side of a lot of our organic solvents. So if you go to the paint store or Home Depot and you look at the side of like paint stripper, this is one of the paint strippers. I think this one's called Strip Ease. It has methylene chloride or dichloromethane. We saw that molecule already. It has methanol. We've seen that molecule. And mineral spirits, which is just a bunch of different kinds of oils. So it has all of those different kinds of compounds, and they're very similar to the compounds in paint. And so like dissolves like. So we can get these compounds to go into the paint layer and cause it, paints the polymer after it dries, and cause it to swell. So if I have a, if I have a coating, and it swells, it releases. And so if I have something on a surface and I can get it to swell and the surface doesn't swell, then the coating's gonna come off. And you can see that, you put this paint stripper on there, it starts to bubble. It's really not bubbling, it's swelling and making blisters. And then you can scrape it off. Okay, so that's how paint stripper works. And this is how the sausage is made. We go into the Hansen solubility parameters and we figure out what is like what, and like will dissolve like. And so this HSPs, the Hansen solubility parameters, which are the intermolecular attractions, give us a compass for making solvent blends. Uh, we do a lot of cleaning with solvents. Here's our cleaning equipment that we have upstairs, this little two gallon vapor degreaser. You'll see this in some shops, uh, sinks on a drum. So you have an organic solvent in here. You have a pump, typically, sometimes it's a foot pump, and you clean your parts in the top and it takes all the grease and oil off your parts. Okay. Then you can put it in something like what I've got and give it a fine cleaning step. And they come in different sizes. Here's one that's estimated to be about 200 gallons. Um, they have some that they can put whole engine blocks in or maybe even like a locomotive engine block, the enormous types of engines. But cleaning with solvents has some drawbacks. Okay, It's, it's typically a boiling solvent that you're dealing with. And so how do you keep a boiling solvent in the tank? Some of this solvent that I have is two, three hundred, close to four hundred dollars a gallon. So you thought gas was expensive. <laughs> okay. I don't want to just start boiling this solvent and have it leave. I spent four hundred dollars and now I'm at eight hundred dollars because this is a two gallon tank. So I spent eight hundred dollars on this liquid. I don't want to boil it off in two hours. I want to save my investment. So we put refrigeration coils on the equipment. And so the, the boiling solvent comes up here, it condenses on these coils, drips back down, and goes back into the tank. In fact, it comes around over to this tank. So this tank is purely distilled solvent. 
just pure stuff. And then we can take our parts and put it in there and there's ultrasonic transducers that shake the soil off those parts. And then we come back into the vapor and give it a rinse. Um, these are about 40 degrees below the boiling point and these are set at sub-zero, so minus 20 degrees C. And this is an infrared image that I took. So we have boiling solvent inside this tank in the vapor zone. And somewhere between that vapor zone and the room is got to be an explosive region. If you're down in the vapor zone, it's too rich. There's not enough oxygen. So UEL is the, the upper explosivity limit. It's too concentrated in fuel to be explosive. And out in the room, the fuel is too lean. It's below the lower explosivity limit. So there's not enough fuel for it to burn. But you can't go from the, from the rich area to the lean area without going through the just right area. <laughs> okay, it's a Goldilocks problem. And in the middle, it's, it's just right for, for an explosion. So we don't want to have flammable solvents in our cleaners like this. And the same thing if you're in your garage and you're cleaning a carburetor or whatever with gasoline, you're, you're taking a risk because somewhere between the surface of the gasoline and the room is an explosive area where a spark or any kind of um, flame would cause it to catch fire. So let's talk a little bit. This is the last little rabbit trail we'll chase, and that's flammability. When you see on the side of a, a bottle or even a truck that the substance is flammable, that has a particular definition. It means that it has a flash point under 100 degrees Fahrenheit which would be a typical temperature, even on a hot day. I mean, you can get above 100 Fahrenheit, on, at least here in Huntsville, quite often, but, but that's a nice mark. If it's below 100 F and that, that substance won't flash, then we don't call it flammable. Um, you know, if it will flash, we do call it flammable. And so this is the flash point tester that we have in the lab. And so what we're interested in is we have the solvent down in this cup, we have a little natural gas flame, and we turn this knob and it actually brings the flame down to the surface of the liquid. And it may burn brighter, but if it doesn't run across the surface of the liquid, that's not a flash. Notice this one went in this door and out that window, and that's called a flash. And it's temperature dependent. Yes? Yeah, so, so this could happen in your garage if you have a gas pilot light water heater. And you're over there cleaning with, with gasoline and some of that vapor goes over to that pilot light and it could run back. Yeah, and so that's how a lot of fires happen in garages. They leave something soaking in gasoline, they kept the garage door closed and the side door closed and the gasoline builds up and then boom, you've got a fire in your garage. Now some things burn quite vigorously, but they don't run. And so this is a halogenated solvent. Notice the flame got a lot bigger, but it didn't run over to this window and so we still call that non-flash behavior, but it's still a flammable. I mean, it's still a, a solvent that will participate in burning is what we say. So this is the real concern. Flames that run are dangerous and gasoline flames run. Diesel, not so much. And so diesel is a lot safer if you're gonna clean something in your garage and you wanna use a, a really common uh, hydrocarbon type solvent to clean. Is, is diesel is better for degreasing than gasoline. Gasoline is really dangerous, okay? Because if you have an open solvent process, whether on your, your garage bench or even in the organic lab, and it walks over to a brushed electric pump, boom, it can run back across the room and catch the whole place on fire. So that's what we're worried about. So just to reiterate the main point, all of these properties really det are determined by these intermolecular forces where like dissolves like. And so if you have something that only has dispersion forces, like a oil or a grease, then you just wanna use a solvent that only has dispersion forces, like hexane or octane or, or diesel or gasoline. Um, but if you have something that's polar, then you're gonna to need to add in some polarity to your solvent so that they'll interact better. And then if you have something that hydrogen bonds, like a sugar or a starch, uh, you've got a nice sweet residue on your kitchen uh, or countertop because it's, you know, somebody spilled their sweet tea. You're going to want water to dissolve that, okay? Because water will hydrogen bond with those OH groups in the sugar and the starch. What comes with the oily rags of combustion? Yeah, so that's, again, that, that enthalpy of combustion uh, or enthalpy of mixing. So that oily rag 
is mixing and, and interacting with other substances on the rag. And then if you can't get rid of that heat, then it starts to climb. That heat starts to climb. A lot of times oily rags, when you wipe up an oily mess, you're also wiping up some metal. And so metal shavings in that oily rag, the metal will oxidize, that's exothermic. And so you can create a lot of heat in your trash can. So it's really not anything specific about oil and like a cotton rag. You know, put those together, they're not gonna burst into flames. You put it in a confined environment with metal shavings or something else that might cause an exothermic interaction, and then they can, they can combust if they don't um, sink that heat. Uh, and the reason we have tops on our fire, on our trash cans, notice that, is that contains any kind of fire. And so you'll notice in facilities, industrial facilities, or even facilities like educational facilities, they always have tops on their trash cans. Because if the trash can does catch on fire, that'll help contain it. it. Yeah, it can starve it for oxygen as well. Okay, but you also, flames want to climb. And so if you don't have a cap on there, then they might reach the ceiling. And if they reach the ceiling, then you've really got a problem. Yeah. So great comments. Any other thing that I can clear up? Which one of these forces is, uh, is temporary, kind of blinks on and off? Dispersion. Dispersion is the one that blinks. It's temporary dipoles. Polar is permanent dipoles, and OH groups are permanent too because they have OH and NH groups in them. So the, the hydrogen bonding piece is permanent. But the dispersion is, is the blinking dipoles. They, they come on and off between the molecules. Okay. And you can, dispersions are strong enough to hold things as a solid state, like wax, your wax candle. Those molecules are just so big that they're no longer a liquid, they're a solid. Okay. And you're not actually getting them to vaporize when you burn a candle. You're causing them to break down. It's the gases, the de decomposition gases of the wax that are actually burning in the candle. That's why the flame doesn't run down on the surface of the wax. You can melt the wax, but as it goes up the wick, the heat causes parts of the long molecules to break off. And then you have little methanes and ethanes and propanes that are burning in the flame. And so that's how a candle's working. What about hydrogen bonding It's really a function of the OH and NH because like a chlorine has lone pairs, but it really doesn't hydrogen bond well. Yeah, so it's, it's, the, it's the lone pairs on nitrogen and on oxygen. So that's, you're good to point that out, that it's not like sulfur. Sulfur has lone pairs, but it really isn't a good hydrogen bonder. And so the hydrogens will associate with those, but it's really not as strong as a true hydrogen bond between OHs and NHs. All right, All right y'all have a great weekend. Be safe.